You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about sports in the state of Michigan? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth, the show that provides research and statistics about all the Detroit and Michigan sports teams, whether fans like it or not, and detects, exposes, and reveals actual and hidden facts and truth that the mainstream media doesn't want you to know. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no coddling, no pop culture, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Head over to our website at michigansportstruth.weebly.com, follow us on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at Michigan underscore truth and like and share our verified facebook page the michigan sports truth podcast also listen to us on spreaker soundcloud iHeartRadio, apple podcast via itunes google podcast and spotify the michigan sports truth podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers it only detects exposes and reveals honest actual and hidden truth facts and statistics about them and welcome to episode 328 of the audio feed of the Michigan Sports Truth podcast. I'm Taylor Phillips along with Buck Gino and Ed Smith. Follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips. Follow Buck Gino on Twitter at Buck Gino the Third, And follow Ed Smith on Twitter at EdSmith313. 16 subjects to cover, some of which we'll grade briefly a little, a little bit later on, sometime later down the road, but um, lots of, quite a few top stories um, to discuss, and we'll start off with more Urban Meyer stuff here. Touchdown, Michigan! Well, um, this is a know your enemies well thing, as always. Our our top story, which is. A developing story. Ohio State Buckeyes head coach Urban Meyer the other week was um, put on administrative leave, paid leave, and now last week we got word that he was detached from school, from the school, meaning he's not permitted any contact with any of the players or the other coaches while on the paid administrative leave. So that. That could be a sign where uh, uh, Urban Meyer may may have to face at least some discipline. But Ed, uh, I want I want your input first. We'll le- we'll kick it, we'll kick it off with you on this one. My thoughts on this briefly are that um, it's just a mere matter of the process what they're going to do right now with Urban in terms of establishing the right separation because um, I think they need to do that. Uh, for, for the sake of public, not just public public opinion, but also it looks good to the investigators that there's not some type of um, weird collusion or anything going on, that uh, the parties are separate and they're keeping it that way so as not to disturb or, or disrupt uh, or obstruct any anything regarding the ongoing investigation. So it means severing communication, severing all types of interaction, so be it, so as to help out for the sake of their independent um of the investigation so Ohio State doesn't come off as being complicit in any manner. Um, that being said, it's not so much of a give tell, you know, give away take as to what the eventual the inevitable or eventual decision is going to be, considering the fact that they have their own set deadline of next Sunday to figure to wrap up this investigation, which I don't know how in the world um, of an investigation this magnitude is going to take a two-week process to fully go over, comb over, go into detail and wrap up. So just like it's nothing, when you have consideration of the fact that there's instance going back to not just three years ago, but even six years before that. Um, and ugh, so much detail, so much, so many wild characters and players in this saga, in this story, that I just don't think it's going to be enough time to wrap this all up. Uh, without, you know, and as well as giving a, a proper sentence or whatever the case may be. So um, I would not be surprised if we heard something within the upcoming weeks saying, oh, the investigation is going to continue possibly into September. You know, granted, that's not what they want to hear considering that the season is around, around the cornerstone, but if it needs to be done, it needs to be done. But I just hope for the sake of uh, they're really taking this case seriously in term and not just thinking, oh, let's get this out of the way so, we, so that um, we won't have too much of a distraction during the season, but it's going to be a distraction anyway because what reporters are going to ask about it, um, it's going to be a you know a constant topic 
on, on all the shows, on different, all the different platforms, on all the different channels. So this isn't something that's just going to go away anytime soon. So uh, I'm real curious to see if this will end up as a matter of Urban Meyer being cleared, or will this go the route of what eventually happened with Rick Pitino at Louisville? Yeah, next Sunday is the deadline. I can hardly wait. And, and we're going to cover that on episode 329 next week. Buck, your say on this one. There's really not much to say. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a whole lot of forward progress uh, in the investigation. Uh, there's been a lot of finger pointing as to who brought the allegations to light, who would have tipped off Brett McMurphy. Uh, Tom Herman's name has been thrown out there. Um, Ed Warner. Current offensive line coach at Michigan and former offensive line coach under the line at Ohio State has been also pegged as a, as a possible, I don't really want to say conspirator, but a, a possible source to let this information out and, and get into the public view. Uh, you know, really, that's the, the biggest news out of the whole week is people saying that it wasn't them that disseminated the news to Brett McMurphy or to other sources. And so instead of concentrating on the biggest picture, which is what did Urban Meyer know, when did he know it, how did he act, it's who told who about what. And so I smoke and mirrors here by both the parties involved. We're talking about Urban Meyer and the university as one, and then Zach Smith and his family with his now ex-wife Courtney Smith on the other side, and those two worlds merging as to what details were given to the media and by whom, and trying to sort out who disseminated what and when, and the veracity of those sources. So it's a lot of feeling out right now and trying to dis- discredit uh, certain aspects of the investigation and of the story that's been brought out so far. Uh, you know, the, the, when you have a self-imposed deadline of two weeks on an investigation, I don't care if you're investigating a traffic ticket or a, a major case. Um, it's hard to self it, You really don't want to impose a deadline on an investigation because what that does is it tells people that regardless of what your findings are or whatever that may come up, may come up during the course of the investigation, you're basically saying, whatever we find out in these next two weeks is what we're going to make our decision on. Well, what happens if something comes out in November after the investigation has been completed? Are they going to reopen it? Are they going to do something different? Um, that said, this isn't going to go away just because the investigation stops. And I think that the investigation, by saying it was going to be two weeks, um, they really hamstrung themselves because even if they were able to come across with a decision that most people found to be equitable or deserving, uh, there would still be doubts, and that can come from the other side. Um, even if you don't think Urban Meyer should be fired, or even if you do, whatever the decision is, the short time that the investigation has been allowed to occur is going to leave doubt on that side that is, is, doesn't get what they want. So if Urban Meyer gets fired after two weeks, they can say, well, wait a minute, you didn't go into all the facts, you just used what you could get in two weeks, and that's what you used to make your decision. On the other side, if they decide Urban Meyer isn't going to be suspended or isn't going to be fired or really escape some sort of punishment, the other side is going to say, well, you didn't spend enough time finding all the facts. So by giving themselves a deadline, I understand why they want to have some closure, but to put an actual date on it is very short-sighted and I mean, we're already in the first week of this, and we haven't gotten any farther as far as what's been released than we were at last week. We're still at the same spot. Yeah, exactly. So I I really just don't think that, I don't think that there's going to be any substantive proof one way or the other to discredit what's already been put out there. So... Uh, I, I think they're going to come up with a solution. Come up with a decision, I should say, that uh, they couldn't find anything else. That Urban Meyer pulled somebody, and they're going to try to move on. And like I said, uh, I don't think that a two-week investigation is not. Not only is it uh, fall short 
in terms of time, but it's going to fall short in terms of effectiveness because they're trying to cram everything into two weeks. Um, I, I really just think that they're trying to do this so that they can open the season without any fear or um, you know, any lingering doubts as to what the status of the head coach might be. Um, I think that's the wrong way to go about it because regardless if they have an investigation that closes in two weeks or two years, there's going to be questions. So um, I, even though we're no closer to finding you know, what Urban Meyer's fate will be, um, you know, they're going to tell us in a week. And if they haven't found anything, then they're just going to kind of wipe their hands and say, well, we tried as hard as we could, but we got to start this football season. We'll get to do it afterwards. And I just, I just don't think that will All right, so this brings us to the beginning of our five-question segment. It's time for five questions on the Michigan Sports Truth. Question number one. This is an entertaining question. I know we're not going to find out until next week when the deadline approaches, but question number one, could Urban Meyer possibly be fired? Ed, we'll start with you. I say yes from the standpoint of the evidence that we know of that's already out there, uh, such as regarding the fact that Shelly Smith, excuse me, Shelly Meyer, apparently was told. And if you you have to assume that if, if not only that Urban's own wife know, knew about what was going on, as well as in the words of Courtney Smith, the other coach's wives knowing what was going on, then it's it's too far fetched to believe that Urban didn't have an inkling of what, what was going on and what was happening. And this is before he found out what he how, found out that led him to fire Zach Smith to begin with. So it's, you know, when you factor that and factor in the history of what, what went on with the 2009 incident back in Florida, you know, it would mean I would be disappointed and, and but not surprised, but, but definitely disappointed that this did not end and so some type of punishment for Urban. Paid administrative leave is not enough. I was thinking, you know, if this doesn't end with either a firing or and or a suspension, then, you know, it's just, it will be a complete joke in my opinion. Buck? Well, the way that you structured the question, he could possibly be fired. Um, of course he could. That's on the tape. Will he is a completely different question, and we just don't have enough right now to say that he would be. Do people think he should be? Yes. Am I one of those people? Um, I tend to fall in the minority on this one. I don't think he should be fired quite yet because no, no. the way he made the statement that he said that he forwarded the information to the proper channels and kind of left it at that. Uh, again, I go back to the Penn State comparison. There is no comparison when you're talking about this because, yes, um, Abuse by a spouse is not something to to you know just to wipe your hands and say you know, that, that's between two adults. That's not really the point. But the Penn State scandal was completely different in the scope that it happened on campus property. Number one, it involved a staff member committing crimes um, on those on the property, and it was against minors. Um, those crimes are all against minors, so. Well, I, while I understand the outrage, and it, believe me, I know that it's it's not um, off base to, to, to ask for Urban Meyer's firing. At the same time, you're talking about consenting adults that are at the time were married, and Urban Meyer's decision to not fire Zach Smith at that time, whether it be well founded or not, um, you know that's his decision, and. Whether he handled it correctly or not is really what we're driving at. We're not asking if Irving Meyer should have fired Zach Smith um, because, again, that's his decision. We're asking did he handle the situation properly as it's been outlined in the protocol. Um, and it becomes a little bit sticky here when you're talking about that because, again, these things are not happening on campus property. These things are not happening in the Ohio State locker room. And, um, you know, I, I don't think Zach Smith deserves to have a job. I can tell you that. I think Urban Meyer should have just said, hey, look, man, um, uh, you got to get this sorted out, and we're going to let you go because you got to get this sorted out. He chose not to do so, and in turn brought this all upon himself because of that. But um, to say he should be fired, um, that's going to be really tough to prove because, again, uh, we're, we're talking about adults, and it gets into a very slippery slope 
world as to what gets reported and what doesn't, to whom that gets reported to. Um, you know, it, it, and again, it also depends on the law of the state that they're in. Um, and when you're talking about a state-funded university, it also falls under federal guidelines. So there's a lot of things to wait through here. Yeah, I know a lot of people want Ruben Meyer fired because it looks like he's a, a snake, and he is. Um, at the same time, um, you got to be real careful because he can come back with a wrongful termination suit, and then that's going to be more problems for the university. So I'm not saying that they should just bend the pressure. But at the same time, there's a lot to go through here. Like I said before, it's two weeks to investigate all that and weigh all those options out it is ne- not nearly sufficient enough. And I think that w- what that makes me think is that they're going to try to wrap this up as quickly as possible, say mistakes were made, things have been changed, we've gone over this with them, this can't happen again, and that's all we're going to be able to do. So that w- that's what makes me think that he's not going to be fired, because if he was going to be um, they probably could get away with it right now. They, they could definitely terminate him and say, hey, look, this is what happened. And, you know, go on with that battle behind the scenes. But with the information that's been currently uh, provided by many different sources, even though Urban Meyer may be um, a snake or uh, whatever you want to call him, uh, at the same time, it hasn't been proven that he um, didn't do what he was supposed to do. And that's what they have to prove. And that's going to be very difficult to prove that he didn't do what he was supposed to. However little that he did, um, it, it's going to be difficult. So I, I, really, I really struggle with this question because at this time, there's just nothing that sits up and screams. I mean, yep, yeah, we should, they should fire him no matter what because he did this. It's not as cut and dry as that. Um, Penn State was a completely different situation. Uh, Baylor was a completely different situation. We're talking about things that are not happening on campus property. And <sighs> again, you start running the risk of trying to legislate everything under your watch and um, that may not be something that they want the coaches to do. But again, I go back to when I brought this out himself. He could have gotten himself out of the situation very easily by letting Zach Smith go the first time he heard about this. And maybe he gets his stuff together and he gets to come back. If he doesn't, he doesn't. But they continue to let him work on the staff. They brought him up from Florida when Urban Meyer went to Ohio State. This behavior continued. They did nothing. And I think the lesson that we learned here, if a reminder gets fired or not, is if you've got a problem, just take care of it. If you think, if you thought that one of, the, one of his coaches was physically abus- abusing his spouse, get rid of him. It's not hard. You don't have to renew his contract. You can tell him that he's going on paid leave. Whatever it is that you have to do, because those coaches are on year to year contracts typically, especially the assistants. And whether or not they retained is at the sole discretion typically of the head coach. There's not a lot of input from the university unless there's something like this that pops up. And so when the university has to take care of something that you should have, then they're going to get more involved. And I think what we're going to see as a byproduct of this is uh, Urban Meyer and his staff at Ohio State, regardless of his fate, um, even if he's fired or not, they're going to be under a, a much larger microscope, and they're going to take every possible, uh, I would say probably more than likely, uh, they're probably going to overmanage what's going on there, and that's fine. But uh, Urban Meyer brought this on himself. He could have gotten rid of the situation earlier, and now he's going to have to face the consequences, whatever they may be. Yep. And we will continue our five-question segment just a little bit later on as we roll along on episode 328 of the Michigan Sports Truth audio podcast. By the way, uh, speaking of college football, Wolverines slot wide receiver 
Eddie McDoom is leaving Michigan by transferring. There's no destination determined yet, but um, this uh, Eddie McDoom was a key um, player in Michigan's wide receiving core. Ed, uh, your input on this. My input is this is that um, the offense loses a weapon, in my opinion, that it could have really come in handy this year in terms of explosiveness. Oh, well, clearly. Because we saw, yeah, because we saw it whenever Eddie McDoom touched the ball. Uh, he was always a threat to break break off a big run and sort of pass you. So that's going to definitely suffer um, Michigan's offensive, you know, as if they already had enough offensive woes as was as it was last year. Now coming into this season with so many question marks around it, now you lose a piece such as Eddie McDoom. Uh, is is difficult, very difficult. Uh, you have to see how how, how they're going to adjust, and if if there's a way, a player in the pipeline who's now sees this opportunity for them to step up, make their case known, or they already had a plan all along, they knew about it, and they just you know let Eddie do what he had to do. Um, as 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 for the reason why he did it, you know, we just don't know. It's not out there. All we know is that he is transferring, and we don't, we don't know what school he's transferred to. So it could be a multitude of reasons. It could have been that he got in trouble, uh, did something that uh, that violated team rules, or he got into it with one of the coaches, or you know, it just he didn't like how the system was going. Uh, again, any type of reason or any type of circumstance. Um, but as, again, it's, it's an unfortunate matter. Um, it's one that, hey, I, as Michigan fans, I'm sure it's the last thing they wanted to see. One of the last things one, they wanted to see, you know, or, or add into the mix of what's going to happen with how this team is going to perform this season. But there it is. And now, you know, unfortunately, between this and the infamous uh, choking sign that he was given to by a Michigan State player last year, this may be the only two things that come to mind from now on whenever you hear the name of Eddie McDoom at Michigan. Buck, um, you'd have to agree with this one. Uh, you know, I, I'm kind of torn on it because I don't think Eddie McDoom was going to be, he's not going to be their number one receiver. Um, yeah, he did give them a different element at the same time. I think that uh, it also signals that he probably wasn't going to be a featured part of the offense because there's not really a reason to transfer it. If you're going to be one of the guys that is featured in the offense, it doesn't seem like he was going to be. Um, there are other players that probably could surpass him on the depth chart. And I'm always in the mind that if you're not going to play a lot, I don't care if you're at Michigan, Alabama, um, you know, Clemson, I, I don't really care where you're at. If you're not going to play and you think that you have aspirations to continue your career, you might as well find a place that you can play at. If you get your name, your face, every, everything you can to be out there. And so uh, I don't think this is a crushing blow to the Michigan offense. I think it's just another thing that they have to deal with. Uh, it's not great to have to deal with it uh, a month before the season starts. But at the same time, uh, this is probably something that had been percolating for some time. I don't think he just woke up one day and decided that he was going to transfer after many, many practices, those things typically don't happen. It's more of a process that builds up from something, and it could have been something that was last, started last season. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's an inconvenience. It's something that they're going to have to deal with, but it's the same thing as an injury. Um, you know, you see this all the time with injuries, and we'll get to here a little bit as well in one of our other topics. Uh, I would treat it as the same type of thing. Um, you had him. Now you don't. You have to move on. And so if you're Michigan, um, you're not going to be able to use this as an excuse if they start to play poorly. Um, simply put, uh, you're not losing your starting running back. You're not losing your starting quarterback. Um, you're not losing somebody that was going to be a focal point of the offense. Yeah, it's nice to have him. But the dimensions he brought were pretty uh, you know, one-sided. Um, he, he brought speed. But at the same time, if you're only going to be able to do that with him and not expand his horizons in the offense, maybe he saw the writing on the wall and said, well, I'm not going to get in a whole bunch. I'm not going to get a lot of touches. I'm going to go somewhere where I can get a little bit more action and don't begrudge anybody for doing it. So uh, it's hard to say because we don't know exactly, exactly the reason he left and we may not find that out for a while. 
Um, but this is something that they're just going to have to deal with. I, I just don't see it. it's going to be anything different than losing the summer to a devastating injury, a season-ending injury, and having to put, plug somebody else in. There are plenty of guys that have elevated themselves on the depth chart at the wide receiver spot at, the Mich- at Michigan right now that and McDoom looks like he may be on the outside looking in. And it's a disturbing trend for Michigan to have guys transfer out. But at the same time, I think that um, these guys are transferring for a reason. Whether it be a good reason or not, that's for, for them to decide. But, um, you know, it, it's not something where he was driven out by the coaches, it doesn't seem. Um, he, I don't think there was, uh, you know, a, a lot of malice on either side. I think it was just he saw that he may not be getting a lot of touches and decided, you know what, I'm going to go somewhere else where I might be able to get more visibility and see where I can go from there. So uh, I, I think that it's not the greatest thing, but at the same time, you know, they're going to have to deal with it, just like every other football team has to deal with somebody being out of the line. Yep, and um, this, the Wolverines are going to have to uh, fi- find some uh, wide receiver to fill in Eddie McDoom's cleats to try try to uh, re-upgrade their uh, receiving core and and their offense as well and entirely. Well, I mean, their offense, the biggest thing was fixing the offensive block. I don't care what weapons you have. If you can't get the play block, it doesn't matter who you have on the other side trying to distribute the ball. And if they're losing an offensive lineman that was poised to start, I'd be a lot more worried about it. Um, they have to get this offensive line in shape for them to do anything. And if it's not going to be that, they can find other plays to run. Um, you know, other than the jet sweep that Eddie McDoom ran pretty much all the time he was in the game, um, he wasn't a game breaker in that regard when we're talking about receiving. Um, yeah, he was a nice, useful tool or perhaps a decoy to open up something else, but it's not something that they can't get over. If they fail to succeed this year, it's not even because Eddie McNew transferred in a month before the season started. I mean, hey, in a sense, you can say they haven't really lost anything because they got a player who has the same complementary skills, if not more so, in Chris Evans. So, Right. I mean, it's, they're not, like I said, they're not losing their starting Somebody out of their starting lineup that would be there all 12 games as far as a starter is concerned. Yeah, he entered the game a lot, but uh, as far as touches and, and other things, um, he wasn't something that, uh, as far as the offense was concerned, like a vital part. Yeah, it sucks to lose somebody, but again, um, you can have a guy go down with an injury and the same thing is, 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 is a task at hand, which is you've got to find another way to succeed. Yep, absolutely. The Wolverines could use Chris Evans all season long, as well as the rest of their offense. And uh, speaking of which... Touchdown, MSU! Michigan State Spartans football cornerback Josiah Scott is out approximately two months with an unspecified non-contact injury. That was mentioned by USA Today and the Sporting News. D'Antoni- Mark D'Antonio didn't did not elaborate. Somehow did not el- el- for some reason did not elaborate any further on that non-contact injury. But um, we just wanted to pass that along to you. There, we don't have any we don't have any analysis either on it unless either of you can speak or forever hold your peace on it. Yeah, I mean, again, it's an injury, and you got to find somebody else to fill the gap. Uh, when you talk about a non-contact injury, that could be a lot of different things. Um, but you got to find somebody else to take the spot. And it, it stinks to lose somebody. Uh, but this is something that happens in pretty much every football team's uh, opening camp. Somebody's going to get hurt or somebody's going to have a role reduced or expanded. And then you have to find out what you're going to do about that. So, um, you know, I, I think that while it's not great for Michigan State, they're not going to make an excuse. I mean, if they go 7-5 and five and say, boy, if we had Josiah Scott for the, the whole season, you know, we really could have done something. 
Um, you, you're talking about the player. And if, if it was Brian Lewerke, uh, that'd be a different story. If it was LJ Scott, it'd be a different story. Yeah, you're losing a, a cornerback. But um, you got more than two of them on the team, and you're going to have to make do. Um, it, it, it just kind of it's, it's football. Guys are going to get banged up. Guys are going to get hurt. And you got to have somebody else to back them up. Yeah, so it's another example of next, next man up, just like what we saw, what we just, just talked about here in Michigan. Similar circumstances, just different scenario. I mean, the difference is, besides the player being transferring, a player just got injured. Um, Position but, player? Know, Position player? Eddie McGinn's yeah, a wide receiver. Right. Because I have Scott as a cornerback, defensively. Right, it's a position player that helps contribute to the team, also. So uh, again, that's where you can make the comparisons of, of what you know went with what, what went on at each school. Um, it is unfortunate, uh, but like Bud said, it is part of the game. So there's no way, any way, ifs, ands, or buts around it. It's just an inevitable, very end of the beast that is football. You know, the way players are contacting at each other, going at each other full throttle, full force, no matter what, whether it's practice or in game. Something's going to happen that's going to be out of your control. That's just the way it is. You know, there's no magical remedy to immediately say, oh, you know, we can protect you until game day or, or whatever, or protect you on this certain play. Sometimes stuff like this happens. Um, now, granted, you said it was not context. So now that makes me, now, again, and it lets me to believe it could be a different adventure, different issue, different activity that he might have done. Um, could it be something that it went against team rules and they just don't feel like talking about it right now? Um I hope they're they're less secretive with this as they were as, as they were with the Max Bullock story, but that's another topic for another day. Um, all you can hope for is hey, it's next man up, and let's see how they can respond from it. Just like Michigan has to respond to the Eddie McDoom situation. Technically, another topic for another week, but those subtractions, one from each team, the Wolverines and the Spartans, will be analyzed thoroughly one by one in our upcoming 2018 college football in the mitten preview with Buck Gino and myself, Ed Smith and I will preview the lions after their preseason in 2018 and its entirety is all said and done. So transitioning to college basketball, Number three, yes, sir. Man, we gotta hear this. Uh, we gotta let our audience hear this. Michigan Wolverines men's basketball among three universities, uh, Marquette and California, California being the other two, investigating a player shoe resale to North Carolina suspended players, whom on Monday found to have participated in the sale of shoes for between two and four games. The suspended players, this is from ESPN's Darren Rovell and Nick DePaula, by the way, officials from all three schools, that um, the suspended players sold Air Jordans, which they were given as a part of the university's Jordan sponsorship and which go for thousands of dollars on the resale market. Officials from all, th- officials from all three schools acknowledge, back up on the sec- second paragraph, through athletic department spokesman that they were contacted by North Carolina and are, and are in the process of investigating the claims. Now, the point is, um, North Carolina, with which self-reported that 13 football players committed secondary NCAA violations by reselling shoes given to them as part of the school's apparel deal, has contacted at least three other schools, which it learned might, might have had players sell shoes to the same retailer. Now, skipping ahead to the fourth paragraph, actually, um, uh, actually check that. The sixth paragraph, Michigan, with 23 pairs, had the most shoes on the exchange. It also had the highest average price of $4,671 a pair. Holy jumping! Michigan football spokesman Dave Abloff said the number of sales tracked by StockX uh, held and ran by CEO Josh Luber, may I add, doesn't mean Wolverines players sold the shoes. 
Abloff said executives and celebrities received the special shoes, as do Nike's Michigan endorsers in the pros. The school itself also might have donated at times some pairs to charity. Sources tell ESPN that school executives, school exclusives rather, made for basketball teams are generally limited to 50 pairs. This is actually still college football, but anyhow. Um, uh, which, while football team exclusives are, are in the 200-300 range, 200 to 300 range, Abloff said Michigan's Michigan players sign a form of form that acknowledges that selling the shoes would jeopardize their eligibility. Like Ed Smith pointed out, the shoes are also marked by the equipment staff with the player's name or uniform number, making it more difficult to sell them anonymously. Marquette spokesman Mike Broker said the school will now stipulate that players wear the. Sh- wear the shoes multiple times, which should decrease their value on their open on the open market and make it less tempting to sell them. Marquette is also stitching player numbers into the shoes, such as Michael Jordan's number legendary number twenty three. We all everybody remembers that. So Michigan being involved Yeah, Michigan football being involved and uh, they they sell that they they exchange twenty three pairs the most amount of shoes of pairs of shoes in that player's shoe resale and and having the highest average price of, of over four and a half thousand yikes so Ed fire uh, fire fire away first here kick us off. Um, I'll- um, I'll say the, the whole issue with the shoes, um, it is something to look at, um, something to keep an eye on. You can't dismiss entirely or dismiss with ease because as uh, what we've seen with different scenarios, different scandals at different schools, um, everything can be up for interpretation. Everything can be seen as suspect. So you have to really analyze the source of it all, really get into the details. What transaction was this? Uh, is there a trail? Is there some type of, you know, a link uh, that could lead to a different party or something that doesn't want that didn't want this going out. And, um, the theory of the you know the majority of these sales being due to some type of donation or charity is not that much of a of, of a hair brain, uh, theory when you think about it. Um, if you do any type of online search or Google search or try some type of image internet for Michigan Air Jordans. Um, you're going to generally see some auction prices, whether it be eBay or or other different web of retail stores, um, or just retail websites that sell this type of shoe, and specifically this shoe. And usually, you'll see it at a high price, uh, so well of, of let's say five or six hundred dollars um, at the very least. So, seeing at the average price of four thousand dollars for a shoe it doesn't really surprise me that much when you consider the fact that a it is the Michigan brand officially. Um, co-op with the Jordan brand, the two most recognizable brands in all sports combining together for this rare item. So I and it's freshly new, you know, the partnership just started. So that would explain the high, high price for such a, you know, uh, I guess you could say quality price for quality product. Um, as for what the school is doing, it should be no, this is what this is a school investigation, not necessarily a program or team investigation of that nature. So um, if it turns out that these 23 shoes were some sort of, some part of charity or donation, which, I'm, again, you do know how recognizable Michigan is as a brand, how it, how it attracts mainstream fans and casual fans alike, not just the hardcore. So I can see if people say, oh, I don't know, maybe Derek Jeter won for the donation. He gets his own pair. Um, Tom Brady, he gets his own pair, even though he has his I mean, what, what, Under Armour, but still. It's Michigan Air Jordans. And so, you know, who wouldn't want to say they own a pair of those? Um, or Adam Schefter, for instance. You know, there's this different numerous um, possible scenarios of where, how these type of donations or how, how these type of transactions could have occurred. Now, if it did lead to something much more nefarious than that, then yes, I'm all for the investigation, clearing this all up, uh, exposing what needs to expose, and there's repercussions, and so be it. You know, no, everything must be held accountable. There has got to be accountability in, all, in, in any type of face, in any type of phase, in public eye. You know, whether it be what type of office or what type of um, it doesn't matter. 
if they're if you are held to a standard, um, then you should be abide by that standard and can't think that you're above it or anything else. So um, I, I'm all for this investigation and continuing as much as possible. And if something comes up as a result, then let it be known. Fuck. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about something very preliminary as to, yeah, there was team-issued equipment being sold on a secondary website. Where it originated from, um, that's really going to be the turning point is for, for the investigation. Was it players? Um, you got to remember that team-issued equipment goes to everybody. So if somebody transferred, they're not going to hand shoes back in. Those are team issue equipment that is, is going to go with them. And there's a lot of things that players get when they're members of the team. So if somebody transferred out and decided, eh, I'm not going to do anything with these, might as well sell them and get some money out of it. Um, that's a possibility. Uh, as I mentioned, and you mentioned before, Taylor, that there are benefactors or boosters or mm-hmm. other pl- people involved with the program that could have received these gifts and turned around and sold them on the secondary market. Um, those possibilities all exist. So uh, we'll see where this plays out. And you think that teams that have these types of equipment deals would be able to monitor where they're coming from, where they're going, who's got them, where they're using them, whether they're not using them. Um, these are the types of things that equipment managers and, and staff keep track of. They number each shoe or each piece of equipment individually with the player's name and or number, so it makes it really hard for them to sell them anonymously, and I think that what's going to come to pass is they're going to find out who sold these shoes to that marketplace or made them available, and we'll find out where the proceeds went, and just like Ed said, if it goes to a current player or somebody that's on the team, uh, they'll be dealt with. Uh, nobody is immune to punishment when you're talking about selling something that has been provided to you and is expected to be used in that manner. And instead, you go decide to make some money off the, the university's name by selling them and, and seeing what you can get. Now, granted, the average prices that are shown on the website are what these players or these people or whoever was selling them are getting back. Obviously, those sites that will be in business by getting all the money back to the person that furnished the goods. But at the same time, um, you know, these are items that are going to be highly sought after by collectors, uh, by people that want to be involved or are involved in the university. Uh, I think it's too early to tell what exactly is going to happen because we need to know where they came from. Once we find out where we came, where they came from, then we can start with the prescribes punishments and or ramifications for the people that furnish the goods. And I'll just say that regardless of who they came from, it's probably not a great look because you're going to find out who sold them. And then the school's going to say, well, wait a minute, we gave them to you because of this. And now you're selling them off. Um, yeah, somebody's reputation is going to get damaged here one way or the other. It just depends on who it was that sold them in the first place, and that's going to determine what type of punishments, if any, should be gained. Yep, and that leads us to question number two. Next question. What will the ramifications, the proper ramifications be for the players' shoe resale involving the Wolverines football team? Well, I mean, North Carolina suspended players for two to four games, which amounts to anywhere between 16 to 25 percent, or I'm sorry, 33 percent of their season. So if you're a college basketball player, I feel that probably the same statute should apply. Um, They play roughly 30 games, so you're looking at anywhere between five to ten games, if you're doing the math correctly. Um, You know, you're probably looking at that type of suspension. And uh, there could be stronger uh, sanctions brought because this is not the first time that a university has had this happen. Uh, North Carolina is kind of the test case for this because they've self-reported the violations and suspended the players that were involved. Um, You're talking about something that is 
being done without the university's knowledge, it seems, because obviously these are popping up in North Carolina, who's gone through this, telling these other schools, hey, the, your school's stuff is showing up here as well. So maybe they decided to go a little stronger, but if you're going to follow what North Carolina did, uh, it seems fair to suspend those players for that amount of time. <coughs> Ed? Your answer. Yeah, I, see, I can see it as as as, as what Bucks pointed out. Um, whether it be in football or basketball, something were to come out of this, a suspension uh, at the very least uh, would be my guess as to who has to who the players are, the offending parties are, uh, the length of time. It could it could come down to the scenario that Buck mentioned. Um, if this were basketball, I would assume though that the suspension, um, knowing how it would end up, they'll probably have the it could be a five game stretch where they don't do it in the middle of November that way it's all out of the way and that they're eligible to play um, for uh, for when the conference uh, part of the schedule starts because you know when the, uh, case in point obviously just different far far different situation but when UCLA was going through that whole saga with D'Angelo Ball and the other two players uh, shoplifting in China um, originally you know, when, when we figured, hey, if they weren't going to be kicked off the team, then maybe at the very least they'll get suspended and they'll be uh, up until, you know, when the suspension will be indefinite, but they're probably lifted before uh, or, or right at the start of the conference schedule. Uh, that's what my thought, I'm sure that's what a lot of people thought what was going to be. Uh, and that was, but again, when LeVar Ball pulled his son out of school, that disrupted all the plans. But I think I could see a similar scenario happening here where, hey, players got caught, um, they were suspended, they were dealt with, and the suspension could last anywhere between that 5 to 10 games ratio, or it would be put on the indefinite status. And then right around the time when the conference schedule uh, starts to begin or and or teams are struggling, then conveniently the suspension will be waived and all is forgiven, and yeah, happy endings for all. All right, we shall continue questions five questions later on again. So th this was still Michigan football. We, we apologize for thinking, I apologize solely for thinking this was Michigan basketball, but it's Michigan football anyway. I Thankfully, I corrected that. Now we go to Michigan. Uh, I want to mark that here. Michigan. Now we transition to college basketball. For three, yes, sir. Head coach John Beeline successfully undergoes double bypass bypass surgical uh, a surgical uh, a double pipe a double bypass surgical surgical procedure. He does not make it to Spain for the um, some some kind of tournament, but he he will be ready for the NCAA regular men's basketball season division one season division one regular season, which does not start until November. So uh, the preseason starts November. The regular season starts later on in November. So it, one way or the other, it doesn't, it's not going to be for a while un until it tips off. So think about, uh, so you can, you can clearly tell that John Beeline will be ready. He, he's alive. He's already recovering. And, and that it's good for him and the Michigan Wolverines men's basketball team and its program too. Yeah, good period from the standpoint that John Beeline was able to take care of the situation, uh, not become adverse or having some type of defect and fall into a, a horrible situation. I'm glad he was able to take care of it, got it cut out, you know, um, whatever it needs to be fixed, fixed. And all that's required from now is just rest up, take it easy with his family and all sorts of things, avoid stressful things, uh, stressful topics, or st stressful activities. Um, you know, again, if, if, if any offseason he's deserved to just kick his feet up the rest, this will be the one after leading the team, the program, to what he's done in the past five, six years. So he's more than earned some, some time off, you know, just, just, just reset everything. Um, enjoy, I wouldn't necessarily say enjoy the fruits of his labor, but he's not retired. He still has a contract to honor, a contract that just recently extended. Um, but every once in a while, you just got to kick back. So this is the perfect time for John Beeline to do that. And, you know, when the time comes, he'll be ready, and the coach and the team will be ready to see their coach back, and then we'll be able to get the ball rolling from there. Yep. Buck, your say on that one? Well, this is a scheduled procedure that happened. 
So it wasn't like people were blindsided. It's like Beeline ended up in the emergency room and I had a major health issue with that regard in that regard. Um, at the same time, it still is a major issue. Obviously, double bypass surgery is not just going in for a checkup. Um, but this is something that was planned out. And I'm sure with the contract extension, uh, the dalliance with the, the Pistons, um, a lot of things that went on this summer for John Beeline, um, his health, uh, you know, he, he's getting older and he's going to have those type of things pop up. And it feels to me like this was a good time to do it because they're in the midst of their preseason workouts. Um, they're getting ready to go to their, their trip to Europe. Um, you know, this is a good time as, as, as any uh, to have this happen. Saudi Washington will be the interim head coach um, for their trip. And I think that John Beeline had all the confidence in the world that he'd be able to steer the team in his absence. So this feels like a very uh, well-prepared and well-thought-out plan, uh, not only by John Beeline and his doctors at the University of Michigan, but also uh, the administration, and uh, this is something that uh, I, I don't see as a big issue with regards to the success of the team. Um, you're not taking them out in the middle of the season. Um, you're not leaving the team in a lurch because there's a major health issue that needs to get taken care of right away. Um, I'm sure the players are obviously, you know, pro- they're probably taking it a little bit hard just because their coach is down, um, but this is something that was planned out that was prescribed and was administered um, by the team of doctors at the university university, um, to coincide with kind of an off period right now in the college basketball season. And, um, you know, I'm sure that he'll make a full recovery. He doesn't have to jump up and do a bunch of recruiting right now. Um, This is mainly preparation. And even though John Beeline is a tireless and tedious preparer of his teams um, obviously the time off for his, to attend to his health issues is more important and I think that this won't be a major distraction for the team and I think that everything will go smoothly from here on out Alright so um, hardly wait till the uh, college basketball season tips off as well as college football and even college hockey too but uh, upgrading to pro basketball we're going to start the What's Your Great segment early on. Hold on. Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. The Pistons hire former Rockets and 76ers executive Sashin Gupta as another assistant general manager. Buck, what's your grade on this one? Uh, I'm going to give this one a B. Um, you're talking about now filling out the front office, and this is a process uh, for the Pistons that has taken a, a little bit of time, uh, probably more time than a lot of people thought it would. Um, but this is just another piece of the puzzle. And, uh, again, you talked about not having a general manager. It seems like Evan Stefanski is kind of the de facto general manager, even though he doesn't have that title. Everything seems to be rounding up in favor of him actually taking on those duties. Um, this is just another add to his staff, uh, whether or not he becomes the actual general manager or becomes kind of a committee approach, um, you know, regardless of, of how they're going to go through the entire season or, or whether they actually give the title to somebody or they just kind of operate without one in name only. Um, this is a, another hiring of a person that is high regards within the, the basketball community. And I think that this is a pretty decent hire for the Pistons. Um, you try to hire the best and the brightest. Um, you got Dwayne and Casey. Um, you got Ed Stefanski, who are familiar with each other. And you're talking about hiring another person that um, they feel comfortable with. So that's my grade on that. Ed, what's your grade? My grade on it would be a B. Uh, same with Buck here. Um, from, what, from what we could tell with his resume, he seems to come from a good cloth. Uh, the teams and franchises that he's been with, the players that's been around to help develop. So maybe uh, the Pistons and that's the basket felt. Uh, uh, after the full evaluation, they were most impressed with what he was able to do in those two specific cities and those two specific teams more than anything. So that might have been the deciding factor 
as to whether or not he was going to be hired to the spot. So uh, congrats to him. I uh, hope it's all part of a good plan, uh, a long-term plan that they have in motion. And uh, it's on to the next part of establishing this process, uh, no pun intended, uh, as, as it pertains to Gupta's previous work in Philadelphia. All right. Another subject in terms of the Pistons is power forward John Luer undergoing surgery repair in his right knee meniscus. So um, we don't know how long he will be out. Looks like looks like uh, probably just a significant amount of time, I, I guess. But um, the, I, I, oh, well, clearly the Pistons um, are better off without John Luer. He he doesn't he doesn't produce uh, much offensively, uh, and they're deep and and they're. Uh, but e- even Dwayne Casey could could have could develop him when when he returns to the uh, lineup or the bench or whatever. But um, Ed, uh, you've got the, you've got some analysis on, on John Lohr. Uh, yeah. My analysis of this whole thing, this is, this is just another example of how the John Lohr signing has been a complete and abject disappointment. Um, you know, there was some excited excitement when this was announced was saying, Oh, what he, what he could contribute and what he brings to the team. But as we can see, it's just so far minimal in between because what he's just not on the floor. He's not healthy. He's always getting hurt or something is happening that's keeping him off the floor. That's not, you know, limiting his production. And I think it's a surprise, by the way, you didn't hear any type of talks. You know, some fans were throwing some ideas out there on Twitter. Oh, what the Pistons, if they want to clear some cap space, maybe they could trade John Lohr. Oh, find a trade, tra- trade part of a John Lohr. I'm pretty certain that any that the Pistons might have done that, but I'm sure teams were asking about his injury status and when's the earliest they, they could see, could seek some playing time. And once they were upfront about it and told them the truth, some teams backed off from that. So... I wouldn't be surprised if that were a tough era that, that took place at all. Um, in terms of that, it's just, ooh, it's just another uh, disappointing chapter and a disappointing story. Buck? Yeah, same here. I mean, you're talking about a guy who was slated to be probably the primary front court substitute. You know, I'm not going to say he was the sixth man, but he was going to be pretty close. Um, he was aligned to be behind Drummond and Griffin in the rotation. And when they gave him that four-year, $42 million contract, they envisioned a lot more out of it. Uh, last year, having pretty much missed the entire season for that angle injury, and now having this happen, um, just seems like a, a signing gone bad. And um, you know, it's, It sucks for Lure, it sucks for the Pistons, but at the same time, um, you know, you've got to do what you got with what you have, and... It doesn't seem like this is a major injury for him, but it's going to be a setback. Um, whether or not he's ready for the regular season, um, you know, obviously off-season training is a big part of that. And if he's a step behind, um, he may find himself back out of the rotation. Or if the injury isn't fully healed, maybe on the disabled list for um, the time being until he can get fully healthy. Maybe he does some rehab games in Grand Rapids. I mean, there's a lot of the drive. scenarios that, that, that could happen. And, um, yeah, it, it just is it, one of those things where uh, he was signed to a big contract and they thought he was going to be able to do great things. And so far, he just hasn't been able to fulfill that because of the injury. So um, the one thing I will say uh, to Ed's point about trying to find a trade partner for, for him to, to be shipped off to, uh, it's going to make it more difficult. Um, I would say if there's going to be any type of trade, it's going to be next year because his contract expires after mm-hmm. next season. And teams are always looking for those expiring contracts to get some cap space. So I don't think that will happen this year, especially with this injury now. Um, it may be something in the shape of a salary dump next year when they're looking to clear cap space to acquire other players. That's a good idea. And, and Stan Van Gundy was the guy – who was the team president and head coach that actually signed John Lure along with then general manager Jeff Bauer to, to that long-term expensive contract, which was very Ken Holland esque and, and we'll get to the Red Wings at the, at the end of the, uh, bef- right before the end of the segment. And I watch it great. Got right. Raving of Josh Smith that still creates dead money on the books that the Pistons still have to pay for for the next two years. Yeah, I know. Maybe. Right. Yeah, and Josh Josh Smith couldn't even hit a free throw, or 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 a bucket, or something, 
or anything Don't like that. Life. Yeah. Speaking of Stan Van Gundy, um, according to ESPN, Stan Van Gundy feels felt lost about his future and and was considering re- retirement. So, uh, why not SVG? Just call it a career. Yeah, he's, he's, he's done more than enough. He's, he's got enough accolades that a lot of coaches would kill for. No, it didn't work out for him long term in the end, but still, you know, he was very, he was a very accomplished coach in the NBA, and that's a lot, you, that's, that's something that not many people can say that they've done. Right. So the Pistons released their 2018 2019 regular season schedule. They tip off at the Brooklyn Nets on October October 17th, and their home opener is against the Boston Celtics on October 22nd, October 27th. So, let's uh, go ahead and move forward. We don't want to kill too much time. I know it's not a. I know. I know we don't have any. Uh, I know we don't have any time constraints on our podcast, but um, well, let's uh, try to save us some time so we can get a little bit of rest. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! Lions lose sixteen to ten in preseason week one. I know the result doesn't count, but um, we have to do a scouting report on each of the preseason games, especially with Matt Castle. He was awful. Ah, you are pathetic! Uh, yeah, Matt Castle looked very uncomfortable out there. It was like a, a, just something uh, of, of a, the offense itself in general looked lethargic for the most part when he was out there. It picked up a little bit better in the second half, especially in that last-minute, two-minute drive attempt. Uh, but other than that, it was just, it seemed the offense for the most part in general, seemed to be stuck in the mud. And that was no matter who, no matter what quarterback was out there. It was whether it was, whether it was Castle or even Jake Rudolph. Um, anyone not named Matt Stafford was probably not going to get much, get much of a, of a movement out of that offense. Now, granted, yeah, you, there were some screen plays and some involvement with getting Amir Abdullah involved. Also, not to mention on Johnson and LeGarrette Blunt. Um, there were some positive things to look at. The offensive line, in my opinion, um, we didn't, I, there's not so much to grade from the pass protection, even though they did give up a couple of sacks or so. So there's still some improvement in pass protection, but still the run blocking, I was quite impressed with. Uh, a couple of early runs by LeGarrette Blunt setting the tone, setting the tone. Um, Amir Abdullah getting involved, uh, with his, uh, movement, space and speed and carry on Johnson's second round draft pick, um, showing his work, showing his tape is not all hype. Granted, there was a, r- a big run call back on the penalty, but you saw his explosiveness. You saw his patience uh, that I've uh, praised about before. You also saw him his ability to keep his legs moving and just not be brought down so easily. Um, there's potential of that being, being explosive uh, enough to where he'd be a gigantic contributor to this offense in no time. Um, it, it does depend on whether or not they're going to be so much of a running back by committee and how many ranks can they keep on because you got to think Amir Abdullah, LeGarrette Blunt, Carrion Johnson, not to mention Theo Riddick and Zach Zinner and Dwayne Washington for, for um, return uh, and such things uh, purposes. So if the Lions were intending on keeping all these guys for a 53 man cut, it would be quite difficult in my opinion because there's so many other guys to help you contribute, and you would think someone's going to get left out, whether it be from the running backs or in a favorite area. Like, let's say, for instance, a Brandon Powell, who I was really impressed with as well in the second half, for a guy his size and stature, still making catches, trying to make plays, um, get himself involved. The effort was clearly there from a guy like him, who to say he doesn't want to fight, fight his tail off and get himself one of those last 53 spots. Um, there's always that think about involved, not mentioned from that, but also between uh, the backup offensive linemen. There were six guys trying to battle up for those last three spots as you go to any of them. Um, so I like what I saw from the offensive line, particularly Frank Langlau and uh, other players. I did like what I saw from Kerry on Johnson. I did not like what I see from the, from the past defense, from the past rush, I have to say. Um, Sans Anthony Zetto. Zetto was pretty much the only one I saw out there that showed any amounts of aggression. Uh, I'm going to give Perry Hyder a pass because, remember, last season or last year in the preseason, the first game of the preseason against the Colts, he blew out his ACL, then play a year. Now he's finally getting back. I'm going to give Kerry Hyder a pass on that. Uh, between Sean Robinson and Anthony Zettel, not to mention Deshaun Han, 
another player that looked pretty good out there as well, uh, their draft pick from Alabama, who, by the way, the Lions had traded with the Patriots up to to get him as well as carry on Johnson. Um, so those players look good. There's this thing that needs improvement. There will be other players on that D line getting up, getting at the quarterback better. And for goodness sakes, the run defense has got to improve more. There were so many gashes out there. There, it was like we were, so, we were seeing some semblances of last year all over again. Okay, run defense not stopping anyone. Defense not getting off the field on third down. And most important of all, the offense they having long sustained sustaining drives, but what ending up with either three points or no point, you know, or just one lone touchdown. Uh, that was a problem that killed them consistently in big games last year. And if they don't get that uh, sewn together this year, it's going to be a, ma- a gigantic headache. So there's still elements of what they need to improve upon. And granted, you can't go too overboard because, what, it's only literally game one of the friggin' preseason. But it's a new season, a new team under a new coach. So there's things you want to type of, you know, try to dissect as much as possible to see what they're up against, what sort of obstacles that need to come, overcome, and how can they overall improve as a team in certain areas, in this specific designated area. Um, and another thing that it, it did dawn on me after watching that team perform is, my goodness, God forbid, if anything happened to Matthew Stafford, they are completely screwed. Any more analysis on uh, giving Kerry Hyder a pass besides his uh season-long injury from last year, uh, especially on in terms of how he performed Friday night in Oakland. Kerry Hyde, I felt, you know, he showed some, he, again, it's not so much of him, again, he's literally just getting back into his own. Like, he didn't play right. much of the first game, preseason game last year before he got injured. So legitimately, this is his first taste of, re- of real football of any kind in exactly one year. So I think this is just a case of him getting his legs back underneath him, pardon the, pardon the term here, um, just getting back into that mindset and the football shape. Because before he got hurt, he showed real capabilities of being one of the best def- uh, one of the best players in this defense line rotation. Now you have to wonder, by him suffering an in- injury of that caliber, will that sap some of that effectiveness away from him? It's still yet to be seen. Uh, but uh, with Kerry Hyder, it's just good to see him back on the field, period, after that horrible injury that he had last year. Yep, good point. Buck? Well, I, I didn't get to watch the game live. I ended up watching it on replay. Um, so some of the, the things that I talked about were spoiled for me as far as I was, I was looking on Twitter and seeing what people were saying that were covering the game. Uh, the pass rush uh, wasn't that great. Um the run defense was brutal. The pass defense was mad. Um, the quarterbacking was, was very poor, uh, which was probably my biggest surprise coming out of that. Uh, you know, carry on Johnson looked good. Um, you're talking about the first preseason game. So the, the thing that kind of gets lost on a lot of people when you're talking about this is preseason, especially the, the first two games. You're talking about you're working on things that you want to see them do in game situations. So they're not coming out and saying, all right, we're going to do this, and then if that doesn't work, we're going to change it. There's a lot of times in preseason where they'll keep running the same scheme, even though it seems like you should adjust out of it, because they want to see what the players do in those particular situations. I don't think Matt Castle looked very comfortable. Um, part of that probably was because uh, he's getting used to new personnel. Um, he's playing with a bunch of guys he's never played with before, whereas Jake Rudock uh, has been with the team. Um, even though he's playing with guys that are you know, maybe new to him in that regard, he's still been with the team and has a little bit better grasp of probably what they want done. Um, so I'll just say that you, you have to really caution yourself about getting too far ahead as to what the team is going to do over the balance of the regular season by how they perform in the first preseason game. Um, Matt Patricia and his staff probably had things that they wanted to see on the field, how players reacted with different schemes or different play calls both on both sides. And, you know, when you're talking about teams that do, are doing that, the other team is doing that too. So a lot of times you run into the preseason where you see teams that get dominated because they're trying to make something work against a scheme that's specifically designed or at least is very effective uh, in stopping what they're trying to do. It may just be by chance because the other times the other team is trying to work on what the, what the opponent is trying to to do and you're just 
throwing into a situation where you're, you're kind of in a catch-22 because if you adjust out of it and try to do some different things, you don't know what those players can do in that scheme because you have, you're shuffling in a lot of different players. So you want to see them all do the same things um, or at least what you feel that they should work on. At the same time, you don't want to get your head handed to you in a preseason game because that can lower morale, um, that can bring up questions that you really don't want to answer. Um, so I think that this game overall, um, the most alarming part was the quarterback play. I felt that Matt Castle was very ineffective. I also thought that Jake Rudock had some bad moments. Um, he had a couple times where uh, the blitz was pretty obvious that where it was coming from and, and who was going to be doing it. And he still didn't man- manage that well and t- took a couple of sacks because of it. So um, those are some of the things that happened in preseason. It may not be his fault. Maybe he did make the call and the line screwed it up. Or maybe they just said, you know what, you're not going to check out of this. You're going to have to make do with what we got. Um, and he had to eat the ball a couple of times. So um, I would say that the next preseason game that they play, that's when you can start delving into, all right, is this team have blurring weaknesses that need to be shored up? Does this team have things that they definitely need to work on before the regular season starts? Otherwise, they're going to be in trouble. That's when you start to see things, because one game capsules, whether it be in the regular season or the preseason, are very difficult to make long-term judgments on. And so I think the next game that they play, if they have the same type of performances that they had against Oakland, uh, from some of those positions, then you have to start to worry. Um, as far as the, the quarterback situation, I've always said it in the NFL, if your starting quarterback goes down, you're probably not doing so hot regardless. There's a reason that you're the backup quarterback. There's a reason that you're not the starter because you're not as good as them. So if you have a guy like a quarterback or a running back that goes down, uh, just look at Washington, Darius Geis, um, who a lot of people thought the Lions were going to draft. Uh, ends up blowing his ACL, and he's out for the season. They also oh, have another. Yeah, they also had another player, a wide receiver, go down with an injury, and that could be a possible season season ending injury. So now you have one preseason game, and two of your starters are gone, gone, and now you have to make do with what what you have on the backside of them in support. So uh, I don't get, tend to get too worked up about the preseason games, uh, especially the first couple, um, because they're trying things out that they want to see, and I think that if you had the same type of performances that you did against Oakland in their next game, then you start to get a little bit concerned because that's a trend, and you can start to see the things happen. I also think that Matt Stafford, um, you may want to put him out there for a series or two in the next game, simply because... Um, you want to get him in some sort of rhythm. I know that last year he got banged around a lot, and they don't want to have something happen to him in the preseason because then they're really going to be behind the eight ball if he gets hurt in the preseason. But at the same time, uh, if you want to jumpstart this offense and get him at least some confidence, um, you send him out there with the starting unit for a couple of series and see if he can't get something done, then you take his pads off and let the backups finish the game. So, uh, the third preseason game is typically the most important when it comes to the starting lineups because that's when they play the longest in, in most cases. And so I think I think we'll see a steady dose of uh, Castle or Rudak for the second game as well and also the fourth game. Um, and after those preseason games, obviously guys get cut, guys get – uh, get moved, guys get hurt. Um, so uh, it'll all shake out. And if they feel the need to go get another quarterback, um, I don't think that's likely. Um, but you know, somebody could get cut loose that they didn't think was going to be available. Um, you know, Rudock and Castle have to get better. And we'll see how that plays out in the next game. A uh, brief note to tag on real quick. There, there's a couple of things that I want to add on. Um, one thing, one area that was def- dropped uh, deeply concerning and troubling was the penalties. Like, ugh. we just went yeah. through this with Jim Caldwell. We went through it too many times with Jim Schwartz. I know it's one game, but still, like, that's something that I think we would figure that, you know, the Lions want to move past on. 
especially when you're, when you're in a game with the Raiders, who's known for getting penalties, a team who's also known for getting penalties. It always seems like every single time that these two teams play each other, there's just a boatload of penalties on both sides as well. It felt like 30 or 40 penalties being called out there last night or on Friday night. So there's that. And also the fact that since we saw the glaring weakness that still is the Lions' run defense, you have to wonder, since their next opponent's going to be the Giants, will they consider throwing Saquon Barkley at that defense more often than, say, a couple plays on the, on the first drive and then take him out like they did against the Browns? Because knowing how bad that, that run defense was last year and seeing the holes that's still there for this for that in that last game, will they want to consider, you know, turning Bart loose a little bit more? Granted, this is preseason, but still, they will want to get their young rookie more, you know, his feet wet, so to speak, um, in, in, in this new experience for him. So giving him some, some more touches against the poorest run defense is not exactly a bad idea, if you ask me. Um, as, as for one last point in terms of getting Stafford involved, yes, I do agree. Um, you want to make sure he's all freshened up for the, for the regular season, but also, especially for the, for, for, for the sake of the home games, fans are, are buying tickets or at least coming in there for one reason, one reason only for the most part. And that's number nine. And if they're not seeing Stafford out there, it will be a disappointment for them. So I would say at least for the home games, uh, we know for certain what he's going to do uh, in terms of the third game. That's your dress rehearsal, dress rehearsal game. But for the home over the preseason game, I think you will see Stafford out there for at least a series or two. And then we'll call it night because that's what the fans came to see. Most of all, more importantly, their very hundred million dollar starting quarterback. Yeah, but the main thing is this Matt Castle thing is uh, has got to has got to end at some point, and that leads us to question number three. Next question. It is actually not a question of when. It's it's going to be a question of yeah, a little short change of plans here. Should the Lions cut Matt Castle after the preseason is all said and done? It, now they're going to have to give him some more playing time anyway. But of course he's not. Of course we don't expect Matt Castle to improve. Anyhow, the way he played in Oakland, I have a I have a really bad gut feeling he won't make much improvement, if, if any. Buck, we'll start with you this time. It's, it's going to be difficult to tell right now. Uh, I think that the odds-on favorite at the beginning of, of the time where Matt Castle's been on the team, uh, Jake Ruyak was probably the odds-on favorite to beat him out as the backup. Uh, but you have that familiarity, you have that Patriot background. Uh, I think that Matt Castle is going to be given every opportunity and done some to make this team. Um, Jake Rudock, uh, for all the time and all the work he's put in with the Lions, hasn't seen very, seen very much game. <coughs> and I think that if Matthew Stafford goes down, it's really going to boil down to the confidence that Matt Patricia and his staff have with Jake Rudock handling the offense versus Matt Castle. And they both didn't look very good in this game. Um, it's kind of a wash at this point. Um, you'd hope that one person, regardless of who it is, kind of steps up to the plate and distances themselves from the field. That's what a lot of preseason battles are hinging upon, is who performs better <laughs> when the spotlight's on. Uh, right now, it's kind of a, a dead heat. I think that if he is going to be cut, uh, it's going to have to be that Jake Rudak plays so poorly that their only choice is to keep Matt Castle instead. Because any other scenario, if they're if they're dead even with performance, uh, I think that you have to keep Jake Rudak simply because he's been around the team and he's familiar with the personnel. Um, you would hope that if Matt Castle was going to make this team, he would have played a lot better in his debut. Uh, so I think that the answer to this question is, should they? Um, you would hope so if you're a Lions fan, just from the pure standpoint of <coughs> a lot of time and effort with him, uh, with Jake Rudock as, as your backup. Um, I think that Matt Castle would have to perform head to shoulders above what he did in Oakland to be able to be considered for this team. But stranger things have happened. Um, I, I just don't know at this point whether it will be Jake Rudak or Matt Castle holding the clipboard in week one. Ed, should the if Lions cut Matt? If you were to ask me the question, should he be cut? 
I'll be honest, I don't really think you should. Only because due to the fact that you need some type of insurance. You need a break in case of emergency glass type of situation here. Um, hmm. Let's say, for instance, you know, again, something happens to Stafford and Jake Rudolph is not performing up to snuff. You could say, you know, have Castle either be a third string or just be on the practice squad. And then, again, have something work from having the Stafford. You bring Castle off the practice squad, have him be the big, you know, have Rudolph, you know, take the reins, have Castle be the starter. And then if Rudolph starts thinking it up, then you just yank him and bring in Castle, put in Castle, that type of thing. Um, I saw some throws, you know, Castle was completely terrible last night. Um, well, I want to do something last night. It felt like last night, that's the long it was, especially on the Well, almost completely. Place. Um, to be fair. You know, right. But with, with uh, how he performed on Friday night, there were a couple of throws that I felt were decent and confident enough, especially on third downs. Like, there was even a couple that he made to Kenny Dolly, which I felt should have been caught by the, by the receiver. So that's another thing to work out to, to look at, too. Make sure Kenny Galladay isn't going to do some type of a sophomore slump this season. Um, but other than that, yeah, I'm more of a green. So, yeah, if it came down to it, the likely scenario, I would think would be Jake Rudolph gets the nod, but again, the familiarity that he has with Patricia could play a factor in the castle, maintaining some type of spot with his team, whether he is the de facto backup or they just keep him around the practice squad. Well, I mean, Castle, if they, if they had to let him go, he wouldn't be practice squad eligible, so you'd hope that he could clear through and then just kind of sit on the free agent wire until you needed him. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think Jake Rudock is practice squad eligible after the season or for the season either. So um, it's going to be interesting because regardless of who they pick, um, the other person might not be there if they reach back to them later on. And uh, you know, I, I just think that with Matt Castle, um, you're bringing in a veteran, and you want the guy that is going to be your backup to perform well in the preseason. You don't want him struggling and have a lack of confidence because if you're bringing him in, number one, you're in dire straits because Matt Stafford's hurt. And number two, um, your job is to win ball games. And Matt Castle or Jake Rudock, who gives you the better chance to win a football game? Right now, it's, like I said, it's, it's kind of a tie because both of those guys didn't perform very well. Um, You'd hope that one person, like I said, gets to the head of the class and, and shows everybody that they're the most deserving. Um, this will probably be one of the more interesting position battles as we go through the preseason for the Lions. Yeah. And that leads us to question number four. Next question. What other improvements could the Lions focus on besides cutting down on the penalties? Like you, like you guys pointed out, the pass rush – the passing defense, um, yeah, there there are a lot of other areas to improve on. More third down stops, you know. I granted did a good job of only giving up thirteen mm. points, but there was a couple of series where you know they were doing a lot of bending and a lot of bending. They didn't break on 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 all but one. But a couple of those big plays, that score could have been much more if if the Raiders had just kept their nose clean. Oh, so that's something they've got to work on, in my opinion, is getting off the field on third downs and having a more typical pass rush. Now, uh, one thing that could work in their favor is, I know they moved in the right tackle, but if you ask me, Eric Flowers is still terrible. So if I would do, if, if I was the Lions, um, I would put Zettel or her, or her or someone else, you know, that's capable enough we're on that right side where you know Eric Flowers is going to be trouble and either use him as against Flowers or use him as a decoy so that someone else can get through on a one-on-one -on -one battle and attack and have more uh, success and pressure in your quarterback. Uh, that's one method I would go in terms of helping you not only uh, attain a better pass rush but also get off the field in third down situations. Buck? Yeah, I think that uh, getting off the field is probably the biggest thing that, that I saw. Um, Oakland shot itself in the foot with a lot of penalties and probably could have been in a better position as far as the score is concerned. But when you have defenses, and I don't care if it's your first string defense or the last guy on the roster, um, that's point, you got to get off the field if you want to be successful. You can't stay out there for six, seven minutes at a time and continue to have success. It's going to wear on you, whether it's game one or you get later in the season. Um, 
it, it's a battle of attrition. And uh, the best way to keep your defense healthy is to not have them on the field. And getting off on the third down it is something that the Lions struggled with last season, and it's going to be something that right now they struggle with today. For them to improve, I think that was the biggest thing that they need to improve on defensively is just getting off the field, getting a stop, and getting the ball in the hands of the offense. Um, you know, that's the keys to football. I mean, you can break down and, and analyze and do all these things. Uh, I'm the type of person that when I look at a game, uh, there are very uh, rudimentary keys to winning a football game, and one of those is not letting the, the offense convert third down. Because that means they got to punt or kick a field goal instead of maybe prolonging the drive and giving them a touchdown, or at the very least, keeping your defense out there for longer and using that to their advantage later in the game. So uh, third down conversion rate uh, needs to improve for the defense. They need to, to stop more third downs. Um, offensively, I think that they really need to work on um, you know, the run blocking was great. The pass blocking was so-so. Um, but you're talking about, again, guys that are used to, uh, not really used to each other, and that can also play into that. But uh, the pass blocking probably should improve if they really want to get that offense running. Because it, it doesn't, I don't care how many times you run the football, if you drop back your passer, whoever it is, whether it be Matt Stafford, Matt Castle, or Jake Rudak, and he's running for his life because they know it's an obvious passing down order, you have a free down of protection, uh, it's going to be a long game for you. So protect the passer and get off the field on defense, and that is going to win you a lot of football games. I don't care what team you are. Right. So, um, speaking of which, um, Former Lions tight end Joseph Fourier injured his ankle while playing volleyball in 2014. That's what I heard from multiple sources. He was lying about chasing a puppy, which uh, real grown men never do in life, whether you're a football player or not. Uh, Joseph Fourier would never would never do that. He's too good of a guy anyway. Uh, he he actually injured his ankle while playing volleyball in 2014. So I just wanted to, to mention that out there. Um, Joe, Joe Fourier w was uh, cut um, probably in 2015 or something like that. Uh, he was not, there was no cap space, not enough cap space for him to stay on that, on that Lions roster. But um, that being said, um, the other, the other thing I want to touch on in terms of the Lions, uh, Tigers beat writer Anthony Fennick act, acted on Twitter like he's giving Lions beat writer Carlos Monares credit on Twitter for what could have appeared to be an article headlining the Lions needing Matthew Stafford in a preseason game that he actually did not necessarily need to and did not play at all. But Fennick actually dupes Monares and the free readers and fans on Twitter with a surprise link to a Tigers article headlining whether or not a catch is better than a home run featuring right fielder Nick Castellanos. Now, first of all, of, co of course Matthew Stafford does not need, need a preseason game because it does not count. It, so, um, and Carl, but but uh, second, but first and foremost, Carlos Monaras actually did not publish any articles like that because that would be, that would be even way way less professional than Carlos Monaris's past article back in June on Matt Patricia losing his players. Third of all, Anthony Fennick uh, uh, just, uh, just did way more, even less, even way less professional than, than uh, what, what a tease would be as a, as, as uh, an article headlining the Lions needing Matthew Stafford in a preseason game. Um, Fennec actually duping everyone on Twitter, M Monares, the fans on Twitter, and the free breeders into what into what Tigers, uh, an irrelevant Tigers article that actually does not matter at all, and that uh, this is this is just like almost spam for goodness sakes. 
and I'm trying to get, Je- I was trying to get Jeff Moss's attention on that while he was focusing on uh, the, the politics and the golf and whatever. But um, this is, this is very, this looked very serious to me that, that um, somebody could had the free, had management that actually held writers accountable. Somebody would have been written up or fired, but of course that's the free ball, right? They let everybody off the hook. Like they let Drew Sharp off the hook for his, when he plagiarized David Harnes' blog about Connor Cook and Miranda McCoy. And, and that drove me crazy. So this, so uh, Carlos Monares had actually had nothing to do with it, obviously. So, he, he's not, he, he's off the hook in my eyes. So, uh, Ed, Ed, uh, you were the first, first other to touch on it. So, uh, what say you? Ed? Yes, yeah. indeed. Yep. Hold mm-hmm. on, one moment, please. Yep. All right. Buck? So, speaking of those terrible tigers, that one is long gone. They get they get swept by the Angels, of course, on the road, and then they come home and take two out of three for the Minnesota Twins. They're, they're still 49, 69, 4 and fifteen. They trade Mike Fires a week late after the trade deadline to the Oakland Athletics for two prospects. For, and Jacob Turner takes his place and gets shelled with seven runs in one inning in Anaheim in, in the middle game, and then he gets either sent back down or DFA because the Tigers had had to make some move with him, depending on what 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 they just saw him him do against the Angels. That that was just flat out terrible. Jacob Turner is still even still even <sighs> extremely terrible. Return as extremely terrible with the Tigers as he was in 2012. The, the return of the prodigal prospect, that's all I can say. He's got so much hype of why them, Dabrowski wouldn't let go of them. Oh, and then we picked the right time of the Banana Ball Sanchez trade, and he's been terrible ever since. So we picked it, it was like a good drop-off point to let him go, because right after that, he went straight into the garbage, garbage heap. <laughs> Boy, that's good for the... That's good for that three-year tanking process, making Chris Hill sell the, those Tigers. Buck? Well, the, the fires trade, um, obviously they were talking with the A's before the trading deadline. Nothing materialized. And then the waiver trade deadline, which is actually the end of this month, mm-hmm. um, I'm kind of surprised that he cleared waivers in order to have the Tigers trade them to the same team that they were talking to before the trade deadline. Um, there must not have been a lot of interest. And so um, they finally complete the trade with the A's, uh, get a couple lottery tickets for him, and um, that, it, it's kind of surprising how it, it all fell into place uh, when, I, when you're talking about they were going to trade him, and they didn't, and then they had to clear waivers. You would think that a team that knew that the A's were interested in him might block him, and either the Tigers would say, well, fine, you can have him for whatever salary is left on his contract, or you or you get pulled back. So um, I, I was kind of surprised that this didn't happen from a team that uh, the, the Angels are chasing, um, just to, to put a block on him, to, to not let them have him. Um, but that said... Uh, he slipped through the waiver process, and they were able to get that trade completed. Um, it, it was something that they probably needed to get done, 
Um, I, I don't think it was necessarily something that um, had to happen because, as I mentioned in the last podcast before, when he wasn't traded by the deadline, that he was still in team control, that they were going to need some guys to fill up the rotation. It wasn't necessarily a bad thing that he was on the team. And then Alavila comes through with the deal later on. Um, I think that was Alavila at this point trying to cut his losses and say, this is the trade that I want to make. And I finally was able to make it. Um, whether or not those two guys that he got in return are going to do anything um, remains to be seen. Um, I, I think that El Avila kind of felt a little pressure knowing that at the trade deadline that he had a deal that was very close and it didn't come to fruition. I think he felt the need to pursue that matter further and he ended up getting the trade completed. So um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. When we do our what's our grade, I'll give you a little bit more insight as to my feelings on it. Um, but for this segment, um, for this purpose, um, they were able to get it done. And in the whole scheme of things for this season, it's not going to do a whole lot. And we'll see what happens. Pencils down, the everyone. It's time to find out what's um, your grade. No, their record right now is 49-69. That means they played 118 games so far this season. That means they got 44 games left to go. If they were to reach 100 losses, again, my March to 100 stance is still alive for the time being. That means they would have to lose 31 of their last remaining 44 games. So if we're talking a 70% clip, right? So considering the teams that's coming up under schedule, yeah, I see the White Sox, you know, and, and the Twins, but there's two game series here against the Cubs. There's a four game series against the, the Yankees. Mm. Um, and and Yankees, Stadium, in the Bronx. And look, there's a three game series in September against the against the, the Astros. Mm. And, you know, Cleveland. Middle Main has Park. Been a yeah, and Cleveland has always been our pimp now for the past couple of years. So who's to say they won't lay a couple more shellackies on us before the year end is out? So the March 100 is still very much alive. Can't wait for that to be over with. Jeez, old Pete's. So. Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. Buck, we'll let you s- s- kick us off on the Mike Fires trade. What's your grade on that? I'm going to give it a C minus. And the reason I'm giving it that is because I think that El Avila had to stretch here. And I think that he got influenced by the fact that people were a little bit miffed that he didn't do it before the trade deadline. And he kind of did the trade to make a point that said, yeah, I I was going to make this trade. And he probably, I don't think he was going to get a better return if you were to trade him at the deadline. Um, but I think that he just kind of made this trade to say that uh, to everybody that was, was doubting him or that was doubting the decision um, that he indeed was going to trade Mike Fires and get something from him in, in return and ended up going through with it. I, I don't see the need to trade him after the, the, the non-waiver trade deadline because at this point um, you're not very good. You know, let Fires finish out the year in Detroit. There's nothing that they got from the Oakland A's that spelled, um, you know, a big score for me. Um, so I'm going to give it a C minus just because they were able to get something. But I think that El Vito felt a little bit too much pressure from the people that thought he should have traded him at the regular trade deadline and was able to get a deal done afterwards. Yeah, this is like a borderline C plus for me almost. I'm going to give it a C minus. It was quite low on the radar. Um, that's, that's, and that's really an overall grade on how this whole thing was handled uh, as a front. From the move to the reaction and the makeup move, it was all done quite hastily. Um, you probably would have been better if you weren't getting that good enough of an offer here and just try to win this out because you had a better chance during, during, the winter, you know, during the winter meetings or during hot stove areas than trying to do something in the middle of the season. Um, yeah, just not all around it at all. It just seemed like a rush. This seemed to be like a rushed Mia Culpa move done by Alavila here. So, granted, the only reason, like, like, like Buck mentioned, the only reason I can't get this lower grade was because we would get something of worth, of value. So, yeah, it may not be much, but it's, it's better than that. Yeah. Matter of fact, I'm going to give that 
a D plus, maybe a mid range D, but I'm going to give it a D plus just to be fair. Three things to consider: the Tigers' minor league farm system is is bad. They don't have that's number one. Number two, they don't have a development player a player development system. And number three, we don't even know who the hell those two prospects are. And whoever, and but whoever they are, they're they're probably not going to be developed either. If you put all th- those three together, no matter wh- which level they play, whether it be Class A with the Lakeland Flying Tigers, or the Single A West Michigan Whitecaps, or the Double A Erie Seawolves, or the Triple A Toledo Mudhams, it, it doesn't even matter. So I'm going to give that a D plus. Next to, next to grade is the Tigers trading cash considerations to the Toronto Blue Jays for minor league right-handed pitcher Nick Tepesh. Buck, what's your grade on that? I'll get a mid-range C as well. And then we're going to grade the Tigers signing Cleveland Indians relief pitcher Zach McAllister to a one-year deal. Saturday night, he gave up a run in two innings against the Minnesota Twins Saturday night in a 4-3 loss. The only game in that series, in that mediocrity series, that the Tigers lost to the Twins in. Buck, we'll start with you again. Yeah, I'm going to give this one another C. Um roster filler at this point. Um, a guy with major league experience, a guy that they know um, being in the division. Um, it's kind of interesting that the Indians and the Tigers have done some business here in the last couple of weeks, but um, that said, um, you know, you're, you're talking about a guy that they're hoping can break the slump or figure out what's going wrong and maybe turn it around. Um, they're signing him to a one-year deal because um, you know, it, it, it's going to be kind of hard um, to do anything else. Um, they can't really give him a try at this point, or they can't stash him on um, the, a minor league roster. So they, they have to go with the one year deal. So um, the roster filler at this point, and again, uh, an open audition for the last remaining two months of the season to see what he can do. Yeah, um, this this comes off as something that you know when you're whenever you're playing MLB the show. And you're done tweaking your roster, but you don't feel like manually putting things together. You just push the auto fill button. This is the type of moves that that reminds me of. They're just filling depth. You know, they're just putting bodies there, just just for the sake of putting bodies there. Um, and if this turns into a, a, a mini an audition, so be it. But for now, short term, what this means, you know, again, this does virtually nothing, either positive or negative. It's neutral, so I gotta give it a neutral C. C as well for me. And then we have a Daniel Norris update. Starting pitcher Daniel Norris begins his injury rehab assignment Saturday morning with the GCL Tigers, and he and he gave up a one unearned run. That's it, just one earned on run on just one hit, one walk, two strikeouts. He was sidelined since April thirtieth with a left groin strain, and that brings us to the fifth and final question. Next question. Question number five, could Tiger starting pitcher Daniel Norris be done with his entire baseball career early on? Now, keep in mind, he, he's 
not once but twice has he been on long-term injured reserve or the 60-day DL. Not once but twice. It, this is a this is a gut feeling that I have at least that that um, Daniel Norris may may actually continue to to do just keep being on that 60-day DL numerous times in his career, and he, this is a, that that may lead to a possibility where he may have to hang up his cleats for good. Well, I can't hold all that against him. I mean, I mean, you got to remember he was battling cancer through one of those stints, those one of those stints. So that was something just entirely out of out of his control. Now, what he's going through now with with groin issues, it is a concerning injury. Uh, but if treated well, he should be able to regain full strength. If this was, say, an arm injury, elbow injury, or you say he was coming off Tommy John, something involving his hand, wrist, or arm, any type of capacity, I would feel more nervous, I, I would say. Um, but knowing that he's just coming off this just has me little to no worried at all. Buck, good point, Ed. But Buck? Yeah, I mean... Daniel Norris, when they made the trade for him, I was really happy. Um, he was a prospect that a lot of people were high on. Um, the injury bug has just continued to bite him. So I think that uh, if he's going to make any sort of comeback or make some sort of rebirth, I guess, of his career, he's going to have to be able to avoid that. And as we've talked about many times, that if you keep getting bit by the injury bug, it may just not be in the cards for you to continue. Um, I don't know if he'll end his career with the Tigers. I'm sure that he'll bounce around as teams in baseball are want to do. They'll try to give him a chance somewhere and see if he can't be effective. And he might have one or two good starts, but then might get hurt again. So I'm not saying that the Tigers are going to be his last stop. I'm just think, I just don't think that at this point his career is something that can be salvaged. With all the injuries that he's had, um, those things just don't go away. Um, people that get hurt a lot tend to get hurt a lot more. So um, I think that this is just something the Tigers, unfortunately, are going to kind of eat the bill on. Um, when he came to the Tigers, people were very excited. Um, he just never materialized into the type of prospect that's that they thought he would, and it's unfortunate, but that is something that is a reality in professional sports, is sometimes uh, the body is willing, the mind is willing, or sorry, the mind is willing, uh, but the body is not, and I think that's the case for Daniel Norris. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, that wraps up our five questions segment. So to our entire audience, if you want to answer those five questions, just replay that segment portion of this episode and answer them the best you can without going out of line. One team left to cover, and that's the Red Wings. Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. And that is the Red Wings signing for Dylan Larkin to a five-year, $30.5 million contract. Now, keep in mind, Dylan Larkin has played with Detroit for three seasons. Granted, he's good and can score goals to the Red Wings, but um, he's been here before. It's... If they if and Red Wings fans are are probably getting high high on that uh, expensive long term signing of Dylan Larkin five years thirty point five million man that's a lot of money that means he can do great well duh he's still he's still the same Dylan Larkin working for the uh, playing for the same Detroit Red Wings team that's declining and falling as an empire think about that but Buck we'll start with you what's your grade on that. Well, I like the signing. Um, it seems a little bit of a discount rate for buying a couple of his restricted free agent years. Um, a lot of people thought that the bridge deal would be the best way to go. I thought maybe that would be the way that the Red Wings go, but they've always considered Bill Mark and kind of above their other prospects. Um, they drafted him. Um, he went to the University of Michigan for one year, was second in the NCAA in scoring. Um, so he decided to turn pro. They put him on the Griffins for the playoffs. He played very well for them, was almost a point-of-game player. And so they decided he didn't need any more seasoning. They brought him up to the big club, um, had a pretty decent rookie campaign. Uh, the second year um, was much less successful, uh, kind of a sophomore slump, if you will. Um, but last year, 
Ranger started to piece it together. Um, but they've always considered Dylan Larkin to probably be, I would consider them hit their top young player. Um, say what you will about Anthony Mantha, Andreas Anthony to you and the rest of the guys that they have. Um, they've always considered Dylan Larkin to be the best of that group. And I think rewarding him with a five-year contract shows that they haven't changed their attitude. Uh, again, you're talking about a little bit of a discount when you compare him to other players that are of similar value and statistically um, that he lines up against. But at the same time, he's still a little bit unproven. Um, he is and is going to be coming up into his fourth year here. And uh, I think that's a, it's a good overall ending because, like I said, it's not too ridiculous. Um, that, that type of contract, um, which is $6.1 million a year, um, is probably right in line with what other players of his caliber are getting and maybe a little bit less. Um, but he takes the hometown discount, and he's going to be on the roster for a long time. I don't see any reason um, that this shouldn't work out. But, again, uh, you're talking about a team that has perennially done pretty poorly in the long-term contract category when you're talking about getting rate on uh, return on investment. So um, it remains to be seen if he turns out into the type of player that they think he will be. Um, you're paying a lot for somebody when you're going through a rebuild that is expected to be one of your leaders. Um, I think with this contract, what it does is also opens the door for him to be an assistant or potentially even the captain of the team if that ever cannot return and goes on long reserve or is retiring. Um, I think this is really them, you know, the organization, stating that he's going to be one of our core players for a long time, and that's why they made this move. So I like the signing. Um, I thought the bridge deal might be a better option for them, but uh, the, the numbers seem reasonable enough where it's not too crazy. Buck, what's your grade? I'm going uh, to give, yeah, give it a B. A B? Ed? Mm-hmm. I'm going to go B+. Plus. Um, I like the fact that they didn't have to overspend, yet still keep him on a long enough deal to where, you know, it doesn't it takes out consideration of what he could, you know, it could be a restricted free agent. No, no, it's going to be a full five-year deal here. Um, I like that they didn't, have to, they didn't have to overspend, you know, and it, it also could be a tip-off sign of where, you know, they know for certain that Zetterberg's not coming back. So knowing that it's going to free up some salary for them at least a little bit, they're using that um, to take a gander on Dylan Larkin. Now, this is could be a situation where if he more than exceeds expectations, he's setting himself up for a bigger payday. However, that still yet remains to be seen. He was indifferent in his second year, but in terms of his, his rookie season and what he did last year, the potential is there for him to be one of those young Star Wars that eventually becomes a face of the franchise type of player. Um, you mentioned Anthony C. You mentioned Matt, but I believe Larkin is the most completed all-around player of, of the names mentioned. Um, and the Red Wings recognize this as the contract that they're giving him. Now, if the inevitable were to happen and Zetterberg officially announces that he's not coming back or he's retiring or whatever, you know, again, this is the early example of, hey, you know, we're giving you this type of context because we're thinking of potentially making you our next captain. That is a lot to put on the pressure of a young man, no matter how old he is or what, how how many years he's been in the league, especially when you're replacing a legend, a future Hall of Famer in, in Henrik Zetterberg here. So between that and the substantial pay raise that he's about to get, could this be all an example of too much too soon of going of it all going to his young head? It remains to be seen, but it's something to look out for. Yep. I'm going to be fair and give that a mid-range B. Just um, just a lot of money uh, being used up from Chris Hill, just payroll piggy bank by you-know-who, Ken Holland. But um, Dylan Larkin, yeah, that, that it's actually it's actually worth it because Dylan Larkin can contribute offensively. So I'm going to give that a mid-range B, just just to, just to be fair. So uh, that's our What's Your Great segment. So for audience, if they have a great for each event, post them in the comment thing in this episode, and please don't go out of line. Speaking of Zetterberg, by the way, um, the, the, the reports keep coming from the mainstream media that Zetterberg is, is not sure that he'll return, uh, whether he'll return next year. Of course he will not return next year because his back injury is keeping him from doing so. Jeff Moss 
of the Detroit Sports Rag reported it first, like a month ago, that, that he's going to be put on LTIR this season, considering he's going to hang it up after this year. That's it. And we, and we were the first to give him credit here on the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. That tops the cherry on top of the Sunday, and that tops the cherry on top of the Sunday on episode 328. Gentlemen, two hours. Oh, my goodness. That's a new record. Oh, my goodness. Thanks very much. Uh, what? Let's uh, try. Let's uh, try to fill in, fit in a college football uh, in the Minton preview s- sometime um, uh, a, a little bit later this month, Buck. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yep, and uh, we'll talk. We'll talk again next week as well. Talk to you, gentlemen, next week on episode three twenty nine. Yep, can't wait to break down the Lions preseason home opener. I'm hoping to go there myself uh, to the Southeast Ford dealership type of deal where if you go in, you get some type of raffle or type of scratch off, and instantly you get free tickets, uh, no purchase necessary. Check out your local nearest uh, Southeastern Ford dealer for more details on how to do this. But yeah, any chance to get free tickets, especially to see a home opener preseason game, you might as well take advantage of it. So hopefully I'll be able to do the same thing. And instead of just watching on TV, I'll be able to cover the game more so live in person. I'm pretty sure the mainstream media has got those promotions taken care of. Thank you very much, Ed. And um, I'm speaking of promotions, I got to get my, I got to attach my promotion, our promotion flyers for our podcast to the Southeast Michigan Ford dealers, Think Ford First, uh, on their Facebook page. I got to message it to them real quick, I, uh, right after I end this thing here, after I end this turkey here. So. Gentlemen, get some rest. We'll talk to you next week. No problem. Take care. Yep. And and that's episode 328 of the Michigan Sports Truth audio podcast. Before we sign off, we want to remind everyone to share this episode and our entire podcast on social media and have their friends share that as well because we want to tell them that the Michigan Sports Truth podcast is in search of a wider audience online that is fans of sports, especially our teams in the state of Michigan. All of them. So please spread the word about the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Spreaker, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts via iTunes, Google Podcasts, and Spotify on social media. It's verified Facebook page, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, and it's Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram accounts at Michigan underscore truth. I'm Taylor Phillips. Follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips. Buck Gino at Buck Gino the third, three eyes for Roman numerals, and Ed Smith at Ed Smith 313. We'll talk to you all next week on episode 329 of the audio feed of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. Thanks very much for listening, downloading, and sharing. Stay smart, everyone. TTFN ta ta for now. The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And mission complete.